So, uh, welcome to the first ever live marketing meetup webinar. And uh, what a crazy uh, few weeks it's been. What a few crazy few months it's been. And wherever, wherever you are today, let me just say, I hope you're safe and feeling positive and uh, finding a way to get through this in, in the best way that you possibly can. Um, this has undoubtedly been a uh, huge period of change for so many of us. And right now we're finding the best way to get through. Um, but despite all that stuff going on in the outside world, uh, hopefully today we've got a semblance of positivity from someone who I personally hugely admire, um, but also is just you know, an outstanding uh, advocate for marketing in, in the whole industry in general. Uh, today, we're lucky to have Ren Fishkin, who's the co-founder and CEO of Spark Torrent, the man waving right there with the, the excellently maintained haircut, I must say, despite being in week six of lockdown. Um, Rand is formerly of Moz uh, and also the book of uh, the author of the book Lost and Founder, um, which I've been listening to the audiobook on my dog walks for the past few weeks and just absolutely loving it as well. So if you haven't read that yet, please do. You'll absolutely love it. Um, there's a few things I like about Rand. He seems like he's a genuine chap. He's thoughtful and uh, he's transparent. He's shared a lot of his knowledge over the course of time and that's exactly what he's doing here tonight as well. Um, so thank you very much for taking the time. We do speak in slightly extraordinary times, uh, obviously with uh, COVID going on right now, then uh, a lot of us have had to change and adapt. And that's what we're going to be speaking about tonight. Um, before we get going, um, my own business went through a tumultuous time in the past three weeks, and, and I'm certainly no victim in this, but we did cancel all of, all of our events. And uh, there are a few individuals and companies that stood by us and said that we're going to support this marketing community. So I just want to say a big thanks to Fiverr, Third Light, Lido, Brand Recruitment, Cambridge Marketing College, Further, Redgate, Bravo Marketing and Human. Uh, all of these companies will be linked in the follow up email after this. And while um, we're all struggling and indeed uh, they will be going through the same situation as we are right now they uh, stood up, were counted and said, look, we want to support people, we want to support everyone here. So uh, I'm really, really grateful for all of those. In terms of a little bit of housekeeping for this, if you've got any questions throughout the course of the night, uh, there's a Q&A function that you can find just down the bottom. I can see that the, uh, the chat feature is already buzzing with excitement, so that's wicked. So if you have any questions for Rand, uh, feel free to drop them in there. And then as we go throughout the course of the evening, uh, we can either address those at any point when it's comfortable. Yeah. Um, so with that said, what we're going to do first is uh, have a short presentation by Rand, and then we'll move straight into Q&A. So Rand, uh, a virtual round of applause, and uh, over to you, my friend. Oh, wonderful. Uh, first off, Joe, thank you so much for having me. I really appreciate it. And yes, uh, what I, so what I, what I would love to do is... Um, you know, fire up this presentation. It's short, it only has uh, about 15 slides and, and um, sort of set the stage for what we're talking about, which is this, you know, I, this idea that we, we have to now market in very uncertain times, right? We have a much less clear picture of the future and we know some things that are on the horizon. Uh, I think we have a lot of questions about other ones, but I'll, I'm gonna highlight a few of those in here. And then I, I think Q&A even during would be great. So, you know, Joe, if you want to moderate that, kind of jump in and say, hey, I think, you know, this is a great question. Let's let's chat about it. For sure. Uh, that would be perfect. And I also want to say a huge thank you to uh, the companies, uh, services and product companies that are that are supporting um, these events in this time. I think that is quite amazing to, to step up, to keep being behind you. Uh, that means a ton. I know that many, many folks online, especially on uh, platforms like like Twitter and Facebooks have been saying things like, "Gosh, I am going to remember the companies and the people 100%. that were supportive right now," and I feel that way personally. Right? I, I absolutely feel that. I think I think this is one of the wonderful things about the human race, and there's a lot of terrible things too. But um, one of the wonderful things is that we we both have empathy for one another, and in times of crisis, uh, we can come together as communities and and you know, have our 
our best lights shining from us. For sure. So let's see here. We are going to find. Uh, I. Do you need to make me presenter? No, I'm already presenter. So all I need to do is share this. Let's hope that works. There we go. All right. Are, do you see it full screen right now? Yeah, absolutely. Okay. Yeah. Perfect. Uh, so, look, I think I think that it is very easy to adopt the wrong tone right now. Right? We are in a crisis. Many people are sick. Many people are dying. Many people, especially in the healthcare industries and logistics and supply chain parts of our economies are having really, really hard times. And here we are talking about how to take advantage of these difficult times and gain a competitive edge in hard times. Uh, and, and this is the way I think about this from a, a moral and ethical standpoint, which is that uh, one of the things that is absolutely true about the world that we live in is that uh, people suffer less when they have uh, income when they have a functional economy, uh, the world's you know um, uh, sort of leading economies help bring up the rest of the world's economies. And so uh, I, I actually I think of marketing as a noble pursuit, right? I think that if you if you have a great product and you are helping people with your product or your service, I don't think there's anything wrong. In fact, I think it is quite quite a good thing to promote it. Um, and so we'll, on that note, uh, let's, let's talk about what's not going to be easy about this time period and what we, what we do know right now. Uh, so I think, uh, most of you, our viewers right now are probably in the United Kingdom. Is that right, Joe? Yeah. Yeah. So we've got one from Macedonia who's, uh, come in. So, uh, but yeah. Oh, wonderful. Yeah. Fantastic. <laughs> uh, yeah. So, um, that's not. Pretend that slide was perfect right when it went up. Um, <laughs> uh, so, you know, the, I think that the bad news um, for, unfortunately, for the global economy and for Western economies is that the United States, um, you know, which is still the world leader in, in GDP uh, by a, a decent margin, um, has made some very odd policy choices about how to protect its economy. So in, in, in the UK, you know, it's my understanding that there's there's much more of a sort of government support network for folks who are out of work and that it is, while there will be many economic challenges in the UK for certain, uh, a lot of folks in the UK um, and most of Europe, uh, most of the Nordic and Scandinavian countries, uh, many Asian countries, you know, the governments have basically said, hey, we're going to uh, help take care of payroll. So you may, you companies maintain payroll and we'll help prop that up. The United States is instead opting for this sort of, we're going to send very small, um, you know, checks to a lot of people, uh, one time only, and we're going to take the huge unemployment hit. Um, so, you know, in the United States, almost all of us every day, you know, um, I woke up this morning, my wife said, you know, our friend Julie's getting laid off. Our, you know, uh, I, I think I know about hundred people who've been laid off in the last week. That's been really hard yeah. to deal with. Um, as, as a result of that, uh, this hits tech particularly hard. So many of you are in the tech and marketing field as, as Joe and I are. Uh, and uh, I actually, I really appreciate folks who aggregate data like this. Um, so Candor is a, uh, uh, a software platform um, around HR. Uh, specifically on the on the hiring side of things, and they have maintained this resource where um, employees and employers uh, report whether they are currently still hiring, uh, freezing hiring, or doing layoffs uh, right now. And so you can see that, you know, even in the at, at the very bottom of the graph. So the the, the um, you know the, the uh, y axis here or sorry x axis here is uh, number of reports. So IT infrastructure, they've had 160 companies reporting, and 58% of those in IT infrastructure are either doing a hiring freeze or currently doing layoffs. You can see travel and transportation particularly uh, hard hit, which is no surprise. Um, retail in, uh, as well, no surprise again. Uh, and then you, you get to you know, sectors that are potentially less uh, hard hit, communications, productivity software, uh, B2B software. But I think 
really interesting to watch this data and um, observe it over time. They, they continue to get more and more reports, not just here in the United States, but elsewhere too. Uh, that being said, I, I don't know, you know, I think that there are many people, especially here in the United States, we have a weird subculture of individuals who, um, and media channels who sort of believe that this is like a hoax or a farce. Um, but the data definitely shows that this temporary economic shutdown over the next you know, potentially few months and, and maybe uh, going into a time frame where testing can ramp up and a vaccine is in development is the right thing to do because it is um, absolutely intolerable to uh, kill millions of people to maintain an economy. Um, I think, I, I can't remember who it was. It was, maybe it was the, the president of the Ivory Coast or Ghana um, gosh, and he, he said something really beautiful, which is, um, uh, we know how to resurrect an economy. We have yet to learn how to resurrect a person. Yeah. And there you go. No, easy peasy. Yeah. So what can marketers do in this, this environment, which is absolutely very scary. Um, and, and for those of you who haven't been through, uh, these before, you know, I started my career uh, in 1999 and went through the dot-com crash here in the United States in 2000 uh, and 2001, and of course was in web design, which totally fell apart. There was no demand for it after that uh, for a few years. And then uh, started Moz, which became a software company in 2007 and launched its, uh, its big product in 2008. In fact, the day Lehman Brothers collapsed in New York, I was in New York, I, in a hotel, I'm supposed to go and meet a bunch of press. I'm, I'm speaking at this event. It was the, the first SMX uh, East event that, that Danny Sullivan put on back when he was not with Google. Uh, and, you know, I get to the, uh, I get downstairs in the hotel and everybody's huddled in the hotel bar around the television, uh, just watching in, in panic. And I have this sense like, oh, I... I don't understand what's going on at all. You know, I've never, I've never bought stock in my life. I don't, I don't really understand the banking system, uh, but it was, it was scary times. And yet, you know, despite those uh, really scary economic um, situations, we, we made it through and thrived. And I, I think that a, a good way to think about uh, what's going on right now is your organization sort of fits into one of these buckets, right? So Joe, uh, your organization, I think, fits into the directly harmed. You can't yeah, go out and run events, right? It's just not possible. Yeah. So directly harmed, it's you know, people like Expedia and at, uh, in travel, right? South by Southwest, a big, big conference and event. Meetup, right, which helps organize uh, these types of things. Or maybe uh, there's, there's uh, not a, an insignificant number of folks who are directly benefiting, right? Zoom. Uh, is up hugely, right, because of what we're all doing right now, which is jumping onto meetings and webinars like this. Uh, Whole Foods and Amazon, of course. Uh, Patreon, right, which helps uh, creators, you know, get funded for their creative works that they publish on the platform. Uh, I myself subscribe to a bunch of Patreons in, you know, nerdy little niches that I like and pay attention to because sending a few dollars a month to someone who's uh, creating you know, art or uh, information that I love, I think is a, is a wonderful thing to do right now. Or you're indirectly affected, right? So um, people like uh, Fitbit, who has sort of been trying to figure out like where, where do they fit in? Obviously they're now owned by Google, right? But uh, Zencaster, right? They help with podcasting. Podcasting's uh, mostly down because of people's commutes, but maybe there's some potential on the horizon. It's not totally clear whether more people are going to become podcasters. So they're indirectly affected by a, a shrinking uh, economic picture, but who knows? Uh, SparkToro. So um, my company, my co-founder and I were just about to launch our product. We've been doing early access uh, when COVID hit here in Seattle, and we've been kind of taking the temperature and seeing uh, how we want to play this. We're not sure how it affects our business, uh, but we know that uh, there's certainly been a lot of people reaching out and talking to us about how they can no longer afford the service that they thought they were going to, that sort of thing. If you are in uh, these groups, I, I actually pulled together a few examples that I thought um, were, were fairly clever. So I, I am of the mind that in the directly harmed bucket, 
uh, if your business is experiencing pain from this, but you still have the uh, m sort of courage and freedom and budget uh, to do marketing, I think it's a great time to brand build, right? You know, uh, hotels.com, right, which, which ran this clever ad, uh, is running it actively on, on, on YouTube, uh, basically realized no one is going to come by from us let's instead be a helpful part of the conversation and a humorous part of the conversation, right? Let's add a little bit of fun and enjoyment and also send the right message to people and remind them that we're here. And then in the future, whether that's six months from now or 12 months from now or 18 months from now, they'll remember us with, with positivity. Uh, Burger King doing the same thing. I'm not a massive fast food fan myself, but I thought this was quite clever where they uh, where they crossed out their uh, home of the Whopper and and just left it put up the little stay uh, at a bunch of their locations here in the U.S. The uh, the thing that I think a lot of direct marketers, a lot of internet marketers, don't realize is how powerful brand can be. I unfortunately, at least in my career, I don't know if you've seen this too, Joe, but I have seen so many people who do SEO and paid search and email marketing and content marketing uh, and, and outreach and uh, you know all these, all these kinds of internet marketing. And it is a huge frustration that they have that these big brands seem to dominate the conversation. And that, uh, that is often because branding is so much more powerful. It, it lifts, it's this rising tide that lifts all ships in web marketing. So I think now is a good time to actually play that. Um, we'll talk a little bit later, but, but display inventory in particular is high and oh man, those prices have fallen. Absolutely. Uh, so Patreon, right? A one of the companies I mentioned that's directly benefiting uh, is doing something really awesome, which is essentially funding creators who are in crisis. And if you or your organization is in this group of you know, smaller group of people who's directly benefiting. You're seeing a huge rise in business. I talked to uh, Sahil from uh, the founder of Gumroad, right? Who's seeing this like just crazy off the charts adoption of Gumroad because it's an e-commerce platform for a lot of uh, small retailers, right? So many, many small retailers who were selling in physical stores are now thinking, well, I need to go to e-commerce. How can I do that easily? And, and places like Gumroad are a solution. Uh, and I think that now is an awesome time to help the people who need the most help, because in the future, those, if you have that, that audience uh, that you are assisting now, that goodwill will carry through for months and years to come, right? And long after this crisis has uh, been resolved, you, you'll be in a, a remarkable place. Plus, it's the right thing to do, right? If you are benefiting and other people are suffering, one of the great ways to get a good night's sleep is to help people who are suffering. Um, I, I, you'll, you'll appreciate this, Joe. So we, you know, the first, like, I would say two weeks that this was happening in Seattle, right? Seattle got hit very, very early on. Um, the, the first two weeks, you know, uh, Geraldine, my wife, goes and looks at the, the credit card bill, our credit mm -hmm. card bill, and she's like, honey, we gotta, we gotta talk. You cannot personally prop up the economy. <laughs> Bless you. I was just, you know, I was going crazy, like ordering, I'm ordering everything that I can, right? And I'm just, <laughs> but, the money's just flying out the door. I think I, I think I probably spent and donated, you know, five grand in a week. Um, and she's like, whoa, 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 whoa. <laughs> got, if anything, the world needs more people like you, and uh, that would be well, quite. Well, yeah. Um, <laughs> I'm not totally sure about that, but um, it, it, I don't know. When you panic, right? I think that I think there's two responses, right? You panic and you go, "Oh my gosh, I got to pull back," and then it's like, "Oh, let's panic and spend a, per, a significant percentage of our savings." Right? 100%. <laughs> we did get a lovely, huge box of pasta delivered uh, yeah. just yesterday. That I mean, that's worth its weight in gold right now. So uh, I think you did well exactly. out there. <laughs> exactly. Uh, and if you're indirectly affected, I, I actually thought this was a, a wonderful example. So this, this company, Wonderstock, they are relatively new. They are in the um, stock photography space and they're, they're, they sort of want to be a free and easy platform for finding stock photography and then helping uh, photographers and creators. And they're not really on any side of this equation, right? They're not directly impacted. They're not uh, 
sure if they're going to be indirectly impacted, but they put together this awesome uh, disaster loans thing because they are an early stage startup and they recognize that many other startups like them were struggling to figure out whether and which government programs might be helpful to them. And so as they realized that they themselves were suffering from a problem, they created the solution, the, the content solution that they wish they could find. Um, and I think this is a wonderful philosophy in general in content marketing and SEO, but uh, particularly so right now, if there are things that you know your customers are struggling with. I mentioned this to um, uh, Wistia, right, who I was uh, talking to earlier. Wistia is a, a video hosting platform for businesses. They do B2B hosting. For anybody who might have seen Moz's Whiteboard Friday, which I, I started and ran for a long time while, while I was CEO there, uh, that was hosted on Wistia. It still is. Mm -hmm. and, and I talked to Wistia and said, hey, a ton of people who are visiting your website right now need resources on how to make a good video setup at home, right? Joe and I need to look good on camera. <laughs> Granted, you know, Joe's got the low maintenance hairstyle and I have whatever is about to happen here over the next six weeks. It's going to be a nightmare. Uh, but the, you know, the, the reality of having, you know, a good lighting situation, good camera setup, good desk setup, that stuff is what every digital worker is thinking about right now. And there are millions more of us than there were three weeks ago. So, you know, how, how, can, they, how can they help? Okay, uh, let's talk about these, these sort of three waves that I anticipate we'll see. Right, right now, uh, this is one of the reasons that SparkToro basically chose not to launch is because the online conversation, you know, for those of you who pay attention to, to social networks or to the news, um, the online conversation is just dominated right now by the, the crisis and the disease and the economic picture and, you know, graphs of countries that are suffering and how much and hospitals and, and masks and protective equipment and all, all those kinds of things, right? That is uh, overwhelming conversation. I think if you're trying to do a big marketing launch or announcement to get a lot of attention right now that's not relevant or related to helping people through this, I don't think it's an awesome time for that. I would delay, right? And that's and that's what Casey and I are doing. We, we basically chatted yesterday again, checking in and said, hey, we wanna wait until it feels like the conversation has moved on to something else, right? Where people are ready to pay attention to other topics. And I don't think that's the case right now. And so let's have empathy and let's you know read the room, the room being the world, uh, and, and wait. I think the second wave of this is gonna be this, this massive transition to life online, right? So there are many people here in the United States who are uh, out of work, who are gonna be looking for jobs on and over the internet. Many of them will find them, many of them unfortunately sadly won't. Uh, and that will happen all across the planet, right? Where those of us who historically have been digital workers uh, are gonna be helping the rest of the folks get on there and we will have an uncertain time period you know, I would estimate, I think it's going to be another at least three to six months before, you know, we're going out at all and probably nine to 18 months before we go out at anything like what we used to before 2020. Um, and, th and that will be the new normal, right? The new normal will be after that period. Uh, let's talk a little bit about the first two. And the third one, I think, is too far in the future to know much about. But uh, yeah, my guess is this is March and April. This is May to February, and this is probably you know a year out. Uh, so this this wave one, nothing but COVID. This is um, a, a meme that I created for a recent blog post, uh, and I I think it sort of speaks to captures what I've been hearing from a ton of marketers, which is, wow, we're all using the internet more, right? You can see this this massive rise in use. Uh, everybody's cutting back on their marketing expense to save money. And as a result, we're all seeing traffic, well, not all, but many of us are seeing traffic and conversions and sales fall over the short term. Some of us blame that on the crisis, uh, but I think almost certainly part, part of it is uh, to blame on our own pulling back, right, out, out of fear. In many cases, reasonably. So there's this strange reality. We've got more ad inventory and cheaper prices than ever before. I talked to a friend yesterday who's buying uh, Facebook ads for 30 cents, uh, 30 cents a conversion. That's insane. 
insane, right? This is for a um, an educational thing in a very niche industry around, I think it was around like uh, flight training or something like that, wow. right? But he's he's like, oh wow, you know, Rand, check out this this crazy stuff, and I'm <laughs> like, okay, well, hey, my friend, just be prepared that six months from now. Yeah. Your Facebook ad prices are not going to look like that. This no, is a no, one-time no. only <laughs> offer because there's so no. much uh, uh, impression, you know, so many people spending time on Facebook and so many people pulling back on their ad spending. For sure. Uh, we obviously have more online attention than ever before. Uh, budgets are down, but they're going to rebound, right? People are, uh, they're going to cut. Um, I think the, the philosophy often is cut once, cut deep cut so much that you don't have to ever cut again. And then, you know, you can cut a little too deep and build back up over time. That's probably what's going to happen, at least uh, uh, I would say in the American economy. Hmm. Some sectors, products, services are wanted and needed more than ever before. Many, many sectors are underserved right now. Um, and so I think the economy is sort of trying to, um, in many places, you know, businesses are trying to strategically figure out where they fit in and re-architect their, you know, their, their strategy, their product strategy uh, for the new reality. Uh, this is sort of commonly what's going on, right? Most organizations are scared and they're doing this. They're saving money uh, and they're opting to do that over attempting to grow their business. But I think a lot of smart organizations are going to see opportunity and invest in profitable growth. And that is that is where uh, I was able to benefit in the last two recessions, last two downturns. Basically, recognizing uh, where that opportunity existed, finding uh, any channels that had positive ROI short or long term, and investing in some serendipitous marketing, which turned out to be, uh, as it usually does, the highest ROI. Nice stuff. Um, one, one thing I think that uh, many, many folks are doing as they are um, uh, looking at their, their marketing overall is trying to figure out where to cut. And rather than cutting deeply everywhere and losing out on um, potentially profitable, high return on investment channels, I would urge you to think like Sierra has been thinking uh, with their, their clients. Sierra is a, a digital marketing agency based in Philadelphia. Uh, they have an office in San Diego as well. And they launched this tool kind of just, just around the time of uh, uh, the start of COVID. It's the uh, Saving Benjamins. Benjamins being American vernacular for $100 <laughs> bills. For anyone who's not familiar with that term. Uh, and... Uh, the, the tool basically lets you analyze um, your paid search accounts to find keywords that you might be spending on that are probably irrelevant to your business and they're costing you money uh, in two ways, right? They're costing you money because you're getting irrelevant clicks and they're also dragging down your quality score because Google is showing these ads, they're not performing and so your quality score overall for your campaign is not doing as well as it could. I think this is a really smart way to think about things, right? Is a controlled data driven exercise in reducing spend in order to have a more profitable investment uh, from your marketing. Second wave is gonna be this, uh, this life online. Uh, we are, so this is just Washington state, which is where Seattle's located, where I'm located. And as I mentioned, we were sort of early hit by this. But you can see the uh, growth in internet traffic, which starting around the end of February, uh, and especially in the uh, lockdown era that started in uh, early March, that's the governor ordered lockdown, as opposed to the voluntary one, uh, we are basically up around 35 to 40% uh, on daily web traffic, and the spikes are up 70 plus percent. Um, and so, this is probably gonna go even higher as more people start working from home and uh, using broadband. Obviously, there's also a lot of non-business related internet use, uh, but that also means there's a lot more attention available. So this attention that's going online even more now and in phase two of this, um, I think our jobs as marketers is to kind of find where, what, to whom our audience pays attention 
in these new eras, right? What's captured their attention? Where are they going? Find the messages that resonate. And I would do that two ways. I, I like survey-based data because you can get uh, aggregate statistics. And I, I very much like um, having that to sort of gut check, but then going and having specific interviews with your customers and people who are high potential customers and talking to them so that you have real empathy and uh, it's not just, you know, faceless mass of 1,200 people who said they're this, mm -hmm. you know, oh, I also talked to 12 of them, For right? Sure. And, and these are the things I heard. So here's the color behind uh, these responses. Do, and do then market... Have, uh, sorry, Ron, do you have any sort of like uh, standard questions that you'd ask uh, during those interviews and surveys? You, you sort of go to... Uh, yeah, yeah. I, I love... Um, so a, a couple of guys in the UK, um, Ben Jessen and Carl Blanks, mm -hmm. they run uh, conversion rate experts out there. And they have this, uh, this great model for uh, the questions that they ask as part of the, uh, their, their conversion rate optimization process, right? And um, you know, a few of those are, uh, what made you interested in checking out you know, this, this product or this sector or solving this problem, right? Um, and, and then they ask uh, people who, so they try and separate people into three buckets in this really clever way. Uh, one, you know, bucket one is people who were interested but never tried your product. So maybe that's people who like subscribe to your email, email newsletter or, you know, you got their, uh, their phone number because they, they gave it to you they, um, to participate in some sort of savings or, you know, program or whatever. You have some contact with them, but it's not a conversion. Like they haven't made a sale. Uh, you look for people who then went through the checkout process, whatever that is for, for your business, uh, but didn't convert, right? Didn't end up making a purchase, right? So you started going down that path, you know, you made it to the checkout page, you made it to the credit card page, whatever it is, but you never completed the transaction. And then you look for people who uh, did successfully complete the transaction are very happy. And you ask them sort of similar questions, but compare the differences, right? So what, what, made, what made you interested in it? Why'd you have this problem? Uh, then you're asking these groups, you know, what made you uh, think that this might be a right product for you? What, what did make this a right product for you? And then uh, you're trying to figure out the messages, uh, words, phrasing, style, uh, the, the problem that was talked about, the way they talk about the problem in your solution of the people who are happy customers and you take that messaging and present it in your conversion copy, in your marketing copy to the people who uh, are just getting you know, exposed to your product. For sure. And that, that tends to bring you more people who turn into really good customers. So I, I, I like doing it that way, right? You nice. figure out these sources of influence, you attract this audience, you discover through surveys and interview what, what messages resonate, and you're marketing in those places with those messages. That's awesome. And that, it strikes me that you don't even need a, a huge data set to be able to do that. You know, if, if you're an agency with 10 leads a year or whatever, you, you could absolutely exactly. do, the same, do the same thing. Yeah, yeah, that's totally right. So, so, so think, you're right, if, you're an, if I'm a services provider, I'm an agency, uh, I only need a few leads a month, right, to make my business work. Uh, I can figure out, hey, where did my current customers, customers hear about me, right? Mm -hmm. The 15 clients I'm working with now. Hey, where'd you hear about us, right? How'd you get in touch with us? Uh, da, da, da. And, and, you know, what, what, what was it made you want to work with us over competition, that kind of thing? And now that becomes your marketing message. Those channels become marketing channels that you look for more like them. Um, Right. I think that for a lot of agencies, for example, I know events are a huge one. Mm -hmm. And so my suspicion is events like this one, right, <laughs> the, in the, um, you know, in the in the era of online only, everybody's at home are going to have to be something that they adopt and get comfortable with. And if you're early, if you're early in a marketing channel, you get so much benefit. I, I can't even tell you what it meant to me to be on Twitter the first two years that it existed. Nice. Right. It just because the. Uh, the flywheel picked up. Twitter basically made me the recommended person for you to follow mm -hmm. if you were in SEO and online marketing. And so, you know, I sort of rapidly grew to hundreds of thousands of people following me because I was suggested to everyone for sure. um, because I was early in that channel. 
Uh, same thing was true for, um, for video, right? Episodic video is not a content marketing practice that even still a lot of people are doing. It was huge for me and for Moz uh, back in the day. Uh, SparkToro built um, some tools, right? Before it ever launched, it built some free tools, and that's how we got tens of thousands of people on our early access invite list. You know, this again, not a content marketing practice that a ton of people are doing, but something that had a huge impact for us because we were early in it. For sure, absolutely. Um, and then the other, you know, the, the other big piece of advice I have around this is that there has, it, I guarantee almost everyone who's listening to this, you have had experiments or things you wanted to try that you ran by your boss or your team or your client if you're a consultant, and they were like, no, 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 no. Now is an awesome time, a perfect time to say, hey, remember how I pitched us about doing I don't know, uh, video content, or I pitched us about doing more uh, guest contributions, I pitched us about doing more uh, outreach media, especially if it is non-paid marketing channels, right? Things that take effort, but not dollars. Now is an awesome time to say, hey, let's pull back on some of these uh, high, you know, high expense, Google ads, Facebook ads, display, retargeting, whatever it is, right? Where we, where we have a tough time showing good enough ROI right now. And let's save that money. And instead of me optimizing those campaigns all day, I'm going to go try new thing. Awesome time to get to try new experiments that align with your organization's new goals, right? Because people are suddenly open to new ideas in because of crisis, right? Now is a great time to pitch those and to get them. Uh, one thing I do want to point out that I think is very true is if you're trying to get online attention right now, I see a ton of marketers making this kind of crucial mistake where they, uh, they write and produce and, and pitch and amplify content and messages that their customers care about, but exclusively that, they're, that your future customers, right, people you think are gonna be a good customer matches care about, as opposed to what this other group of people, in, uh, influential publications and people that your customers listen to, right? The, the podcasters and video channel owners and, and, and media sources and bloggers in your industry and people nice. with uh, powerful social accounts that reach lots of folks and YouTube channels and right, all those sources of influence. If you can create stuff in the intersection of these two, uh, I think you achieve far more amplification potential, far more reach potential in a noisy ecosystem uh, than if you just target what customers care about. Nice. And if I were gonna lean in a direction, I'd lean to the influential publication side of this. Because when it comes to uh, brand building and attracting people to you, getting them comfortable with knowing you, liking you, trusting you, uh, that often tends to work better. And you can always go create stuff for your customers that is more uh, product-centric and customer-centric that's not what we, we kind of think of as amplifiable content marketing. Interesting. I've never heard anyone say that before. So that's really, it's, uh, that's a really unique take, you know, <laughs> but it yeah, makes sense. I, I just, I just see so many, you know, um, I see agencies and consultants do this. I see SEO folks do it. I see, um, you know, who's great at this is PR folks, mm -hmm. right? PR folks are kind of like, no, they'll shoot down 50 ideas, right? They'll happily shoot down 50 ideas because they know it won't resonate with what, you know, publications and journalists will listen to and care about and help amplify. Mm -hmm. And that, that is actually a pretty smart way of thinking. I think that's one of the reasons that uh, PR, even as it's struggled to become as uh, digital and high tech and as, um, you know, cutting edge as it, as it could be, which many folks in PR you know, complain about, uh, it's still an incredibly valuable practice because it, it, it biases to what do people who can amplify my message want to hear? Let's make that for them. Nice. And there's a question here from uh, Martin Williams. It says, can you provide an example of what that intersection might look like? Um, and maybe- Sure, yeah. Example. So, Just uh, I mean, I think that this is, if you go back, Right, if we go back here, uh, let's go back up here. Pretty much every example that I showed here 
is doing exactly that, right? The, the hotels.com guy washing his hands and staying home with popcorn doesn't, it's not what his customers care about, right? Hotel.com customers, they care about price and they care about uh, convenience and they care about refunds and they care about being able to change things. And they care about inventory selection, blah, blah, blah. And hotels.com is not talking about their features or their benefits. Mm -hmm. They are making an emotional, memorable, right, uh, sort of message that is likely to be amplified. And, and what's beautiful about that is it's a paid ad, right? This is a 15 second ad spot sure. and they don't have to pay to amplify it. They just make it and they know millions of people will share it because mm -hmm. they think, oh, that's cute. That's funny. Oh, it's, it's timely. It's well done. It's empathetic, right? The stay home thing too. You know, I, I don't know, maybe it's 500 bucks per, you know, making of a stay sign and putting it up at yeah. each location. And they know that they're going to get huge amounts of press and media coverage and Instagram posts and all, all this stuff, right? Um, same thing with the Patreon uh, guys, right? They know they're going to get huge amounts of coverage and support creators. They know that all the creators who benefit, uh, it, it's not just serving their customers. It's also serving public interest. Sure. which means it will get amplified. Same thing with Wonderstock. Nice. Um, you know, we talked about the... That's probably the difference between some of the campaigns, uh, such as the stock image that won the Khan Lion, versus, you know, this is something that is serving both audiences rather than being for the award or, you know... Yeah, just, just yeah, yeah. Uh, the, I mean, the, you know, Sears Saving Benjamins thing, right? It's... Uh, yes, it is helpful to Sears customers, but Sears customers were getting this already, yeah. right? They were already getting this service, you know, white glove service from, from Sears uh, folks. Sears putting this out there to show thought leadership in a way that is amplification worthy yeah. for, you know, lots of marketers like us, right? They know that, oh, this is going to exactly appeal to what everyone who's talking about saving money in their ad budgets is talking about right now. And so Sierra is going to get this mention For smart, sure. right? It's not just helping customers. It's helping, uh, it, it is serving the interest of people who have message uh, uh, platforms to amplify the message. Absolutely. And so, um, as you so are well doing that, right now. <laughs> sorry? As you are doing well right now. <laughs> I, I mean, right? So, so I, I'm, I'm on sort of both sides of these equations, right? I have this uh, uh, big platform and also I am a marketer who, kind of uh, recognize this stuff. And so I, I can see like the, oh, this appeals to me as a person with a platform who wants to amplify things that I know other people will share, mm -hmm. right? Um, one of the, I think one of the things that's, that's great is to get inside the mind of people who have platforms uh, that includes, you know, journalists and, and newspapers and, and websites, that includes bloggers, that includes social media, that includes video channel creators and podcasters, event organizers, right? All those people who have platforms where they can amplify your message mm -hmm. and to think like them. I am a podcaster. Why would I cover my company's work? For sure. Right? What, what would possibly interest me about covering that? And if you have a great story there, you get to be at the intersection of this. Absolutely. And I think that intersection is really, really important to, uh, to, restate because there's a question here that's come from Andrew uh, which says uh, successful campaigns promoting to influential pub publications as opposed to direct to the customer is that true of b2b and it's it's not that you're targeting yes. one or the other you're targeting both and and you're doing it at the same time um, you, you, you can you can but I, my uh, right my contention is that in general there's more stuff that lives in the customer cares uh, what your customers care about and you have more opportunity to market to them once they're already on your website right once they're already in your audience they're on your email list interested creating stuff for them is almost um uh the the second step after you have uh earned this amplification and it, it it depends on your goals right if you have a huge audience already paying attention to you you are the platform a uh, good example of this is like hubspot's blog if you read HubSpot's blog, most of the content there is not for influential people in publications because HubSpot doesn't need to really serve them. They get covered all the time anyway, right? They're a huge public company, big brand, have, have lots of reasons for coverage, yada, yada. 
What they need is to serve their customers with their content. And so that is what they are creating. But many, many marketers, I think, follow in the footsteps of HubSpot when in fact their problem is not uh, serving their customers with content, it's capturing new customers, getting more people aware of them, getting more people familiar with them, getting more people to trust them and like them so that they convert and get into this bucket. And then we serve, you know, we serve them. I would say at Moz, we were about half and half with Spark Toro, I have been because the you know because we're not live yet. I am all in the red circle, not the blue circle. Interesting. Right? That's all I worry about now. In the future, I will need to worry about the blue circle as well, right? And so it, it just pays to uh, align your problem with your strategy and tactics. Nice, cool, awesome. So we're we're actually at the end of the of the formal presentation because. All I want to say about wave three, right, this new normal that we will eventually be in is we don't know what it will look like. And I, I don't think it is wise. I think in marketing, um, my experience has been that whenever I have tried to predict the long-term future and optimize toward that, I have failed because the, the future is not uh, nearly as noble. And marketing is one of those places where you can see where people go and how they change. And as long as you have empathy, you are constantly listening to and talking to your customers and their influencers of all kinds, mm -hmm. you can then market in the right ways. You don't need to lead, you can follow. I think, you know, if we're talking about product strategy, it's a little different, but in marketing, I don't recommend, um, I don't know, uh, being ahead of the curve, just on the curve, right? Mm -hmm. um, I think it, I don't think it paid particularly to, uh, you know, get hugely into Google Plus uh, in its first year of operation. I think it paid to have an account and to to watch and to listen and to see if your customers were adopting it and then to go there. Um, TikTok is kind of similar right now, right? It's on this like the cusp of this bubble. Are we going to see it become more than a short form video entertainment platform? Is there opportunity for anyone but CPG brands right now? I don't really know. Let's see, let's see how it goes. Let's listen to our customers and see if they're going there. Um, and, and I think we can, we can play it that way. But the new normal will come and as long as we're paying attention, we can serve our audience well. So stay safe folks, stay at home, wash your hands. <laughs> get through this together. Absolutely well, that's awesome. Yeah, let's do some Q and A. Brilliant. Thank you very much, Rand. Um, so the first question, which is the one that's been the most upvoted, so folks can get their questions in and you can also uh, like other people's questions. So you, you'll uh, be able to get the most popular questions answered first. Um, this was covered in the presentation, um, but I think it would be good to re-emphasize because a few folks have uh, asked for it. So the question is from uh, Krishna, when is the right time to market yourself during a crisis? Um, and she's left it at that, so I'll leave it as wide as yeah. that for you too. Uh, so I think it, I think it depends a little bit. Let, let's go um, back up here. I think it depends a little bit on uh, like where you are on along these these vectors. Uh, if you are someone who is um, directly harmed or directly benefiting, uh, I think that it is okay to market yourself. Um, relatively immediately so long as it is in the right way uh, and if you're indirectly affected i think that it's a great time to be listening to your audience and your customers and your future potential customers and to find ways that you can be helpful and then do marketing uh, in those helpful ways like i said before you know we're um we're sort of thinking about this really hard with spark toro because uh, Casey and I are kind of in this world of, well, do we want to launch our new product and try and earn attention in the midst of a conversation that, that we're not a direct part of? And our, you know, our instincts are telling us that it's not the right time to do that. Now's a great time to do, you know, some early access testing and send it out to people, you know, send invitations out to people who are on our list. Uh, on our email list and, and have them uh, try the product out and, and play around with it. But, you know, that one-to-one -one attention is great, but but a broader attempt to get lots of people in the marketing world to talk about SparkToro's launch, it's gonna fall on deaf ears, right? It feels like sure. um, 
you're banging a drum in the middle of an acapella choir <laughs> concert. Like it doesn't, it doesn't work. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. Um, and so you want to, you know, you want to wait until those singers are done. And then when the marching band steps in again, okay, now, now we're ready for your drum. Mm -hmm. So it, the answer is it depends. As all the, all the good answers do, generally speaking. Um, yeah. But yeah, I mean, that, that, that first phase of, of identifying who you are um, and where you sit in that market, that's, that's a, a good way of thinking of it. Okay, uh, next. And um, this is a, uh, a huge question for marketers in general, and I guess it comes down to both attribution, but then also, um, you know, our job as marketers to market marketing, uh, which is how can you convince clients that the time to build your brand is now? A lot of businesses are scared to invest money in their companies uh, in the current climate. Uh, my best answer for this is uh, play to their competitive spirit. Nice. So historically, one of the things that is great to look at is how uh, how brands have been built, and usually uh, their biggest upward slopes are in the months and years following uh, either a macroeconomic recession, sort of across the whole economy like we're experiencing now, mm -hmm. or a downturn in their particular sector. Right. That is when you see brands uh, rise, right? And almost every brand you can name has gone through this um, during those periods. So I, I think what's great is to identify competitors of your you know, client uh, or of your current company, if you're, if you're in an in-house, part of an in-house team, and to say like, hey, boss, team, client, this is what your competitors are doing. They are, you know, they are taking advantage of the fact that you know, online attention is high, ad inventory is cheap, um, you know, uh, uh, there's opportunity to do empathetic, thoughtful marketing right now. There's opportunities to, right, to do things that are helpful to people who need these resources and to, and to earn their future business as a result. Awesome. Let's experiment, right? Let, let's, not, let, let's not let this sit because in six months, it's, the world is not going to look this way. Right? We are not going to have these opportunities that are available to us right now. The biggest one, of course, is helping people and benefiting in return. Right? And that, um, that reciprocal sort of thing in our, uh, in our lizard brains is extremely powerful. And so let's find ways that we can uh, execute on that. Not, you know, not only because it's marketing, even though that, that might be how you pitch it, but also because it feels great feels awesome to go out and help people uh, in, in times of need. And, uh, and then it feels you know, just as good in the, in the months following to benefit, to reap the rewards of those investments. Um, but if you're doing the pitch, I think the competitive angle is the best one to play, right? Show examples of, you know, go whatever, hop into Google Trends, show that yes, a bunch of search volume is down in our sector, but look at these few terms that are ri sky, rising sky high. Mm -hmm. What what could we do? Could we create some content around some of them? Could we do some marketing and promotion around some of them? Do we want to buy some ads around some of them? Do we want to do concept stuff? Do we want to do some display and retargeting stuff because it's cheap right now? Do we want to do some uh, podcast advertising because it is it's dirt cheap right now? Do we want to do some sponsorships of webinars because no one's doing that? <laughs> that would be quite lovely. <laughs> well, I'm just, right? I'm just I'm just saying that you know there are. Literally uh, tens of, I talked to the folks at SimilarWeb. I don't know if, um, if you're familiar with them, but here I can, uh, let me show, can I share my other you're, you're, screen? Yeah, yeah, you're still sharing, so. Uh, stop that share, share this one, share, okay. Uh, wait, you go down, you come up. Okay, so um, yeah, so I was, talking to the folks at similar web and I gave them this nudge like hey you have all this crazy awesome data like let's uh let's go see what um yeah okay so they added this message at the top of their site now right where you can check out all of this incredible data the, 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 uh, similar web is a clickstream data provider uh, out of Israel right and they have all these um, remarkable insights about things that are rising and falling, uh, similar to Google Trends but it's not just search volume it's based on website traffic data. Mm -hmm. And so they have this sort of, you know, here's how uh, these sectors are getting impacted, et cetera, et cetera. And then they have these webinars 
Um, and, and they were telling me that, uh, you know, they anticipate 100, 150 people usually join their webinar and they were packed. They were filled to the maximum thousand limit. Nice. And then they couldn't accept any more people. That's right? Because it's just that the, an overwhelming number of market researchers and, and marketers and, and people who, who care about this stuff are interested in what they're doing right now. For sure. Great. That's, they are marketing, but they're also helping people. There's Absolutely. a ton of demand, right? I need help. 100%. Um, I want information. Uh, I, you know, if you're anything like me, you're addicted to information right now. I mean, in many ways, this feels like it's kind of hit, um, really put into perspective what marketing is. You know, so, you know, for me, I define marketing as meeting the needs of the customer. And, and yes. what we're actually right. focusing far less on is, you know, the fancy tactics, the fancy whatever. And we're just going back to the bare roots and, and this sentiment of helping people and saying, look, you've got this problem and we feel it too. Uh, and this is what we're doing about it to help you or, or, or whatever it may be. But, you know, I think because we're all sharing this common problem right now, uh, if anything, marketing has become more easy than ever because we're all experiencing the same emotions as everyone else. We're all going through that same journey. Yeah. Um, so really, when you look at it through that lens, then I guess, you know, you look at it through a business lens as well. You sort of say, okay, so I'm experiencing these emotions. So what can our business to help these end users? I, you know. Yeah, I mean, I, I, you know, personally, in my personal life, I bet this is true for a lot of you who are on this, this webinar, right? I alternate between, oh my God, this, this crisis is so overwhelming. There's so much tragedy and sadness and, and, and heartache and fear that I feel overwhelmed. I can't, I can't mentally process this. Like I, um, I need to just sit on my couch and watch Netflix and play <laughs> animal crossing. Yep. Right. Uh, and then, and then a few hours later, it'll flip to, I have to do something like I need, I need to do something positive to help people. And, and sometimes that's, I need to support some local businesses. I need to donate to some charities. I need to create a blog post. I need to put together, you know, uh, fling together some slides and, and help Joe with this webinar. I need to like reach out to my friends and see what, you know, what they're up to and how I can be helpful. And, and I think you can channel uh, both of those, right? You can channel that, um, that empathy that you have for people who are feeling that overwhelmed sense, right? And you can surprise and delight and entertain them. And that's fine, right? Um, if you're Patrick Stewart, <laughs> you just want to read. You want to read some Shakespeare sonnets, you know, in thirty-second clips for Twitter. Yeah. Oh my God! Please, that is so. You know, that's so helpful. It's so wonderful right now. Mm -hmm. And if you are similar web, right, you can uh, create these these wonderful resources and you know help help people with uh, webinars and data on uh, on all these different um, vectors. I think that's awesome too. Absolutely. Right? Um, yeah, I, I don't I don't think it is the case that uh, only um, only one or the other are true. I think they're both simultaneously happening. Absolutely. And there's a question here on um, from Adam, uh, which follows on from this somewhat, which is um, again about brand building. But I guess an element of this requires faith that is going to turn out that once you've built that brand, um, that they're then going to convert, you know, and, and brand building in the short term, at least doesn't necessarily drive that, that acquisition based activity, which, you know, every CEO, every MD wants to see. So, um, do you have any advice on how people can, uh, convince data driven companies to take, uh, brand more seriously and, you know, the associated metrics, I guess, as well. Yeah, I, I think the, um, the best way that I've seen it is to look at why uh, certain brands overperform with all of their digital channels, right? Essentially, you, you can see that uh, in any given sector, there are usually two or three brands where when their ad appears, they get much higher click-through rates. When their emails get sent, they get much higher open rates. Uh, when their uh, content is promoted, it gets much higher click-throughs from search and social and organic channels, right? And, and the reason that that is, is almost always brand, right? Mm -hmm. It's because we have that um, familiarity. It's why, you know, new, uh, whatever, new restaurant that's amazing uh, and offers, you know, great food in your neighborhood. Well, yeah, okay, I, I, I should check that out sometime in the next month. 
but you're still going to, you know, um, I, I don't know what it is in the UK. Here in the US, right, it's, it's like one of several chains, yeah. and I don't understand why chain restaurants work at all, but they <laughs> work extraordinarily well uh, uh, because of brand, Yeah. right? So I'm going to Wendy's, I'm going to McDonald's, I'm going to Burger King because I have that brand association, that familiarity, that trust that comes from it. And so they overperform uh -huh. uh, on all these on all these other metrics, right? Yep. Um, and I think this is a, you know, it's a little bit of a, a strange thing, but it is very provable. Mm -hmm. In every sector, it's very provable. And so I think you're you're wanting to make those. The the other thing I'd say a little bit is. If you're struggling to have that conversation, right? If your MD, your team, your client is not embracing that, I might look for people who do. Mm -hmm. Right? I think that I think that the folks who are going to do well through uh, this crisis and through the opportunities that follow and in the years ahead are people who understand uh, these concepts. And so, if if you are having those conversations and folks are saying, "Ah, oh, well," You know, well, I don't, I don't really believe brand is a thing. I don't think that's why people make decisions. Yeah. Maybe it's say, oh, okay, yeah, yeah. Let me just look for a new job here. <laughs> let me find some other clients here, because sure. I, I, I don't think that you're gonna get um, th those folks tend not to perform long term. Absolutely, I think it's something Dave Gerhardt said, um, who was uh, formerly of Drift and now of um, Privy. You know, and he said that the best asset you can have as a marketer is a a CEO and who understands marketing, you know, because yeah. you can have those conversations. Um, Absolutely. And, and now is, is kind of, it, it's kind of a great time to go to someone and say, Hey, we're in crisis. The mm -hmm. world's in crisis. Let's, let's open our minds to new ideas. For sure. Right? And, and conversely, um, so for those folks and there will be folks out there and, and, you know, I entered panic mode myself a couple of weeks ago, so I know hundred percent how this feels. Um, but you spoke about growth hacks and avoiding them in, in your book and how you sort of regret sort of this short termism and, you know, that's that sort of that kind of thinking. Um, but right now there's a reality that some folks will be just like, I need some money in the bank. Uh, I need, you know, something to survive tomorrow. And yeah. I, I don't know whether you can speak to that from your experience, but um, how would you approach that today? You know, maybe as a founder, you know, just as, as someone who's a business person, um, striking yeah. that balance. No, I mean, we, uh, Casey and I are living this very, you know, that is, that is totally our reality. Mm -hmm. um, and so I, let me go, I'm going to show a presentation. It's an, uh, an older presentation, but I think it is super relevant. Just a few slides to me because I think that'll help answer uh, that question in particular let's go share okay it's a man with a presentation so presentation. when i think about this like uh sorry say again a man with a presentation for every question it's great <laughs> uh, well yeah i i mean i just um as you might imagine I'm sure as, as we all recognize, right? Any questions come up many times. So, <laughs> sure. um, so th this is a presentation that specifically I give to um, uh, startup founders typically and, and historically, but, but uh, in here is this little section about like cha channels and tactics to invest in early when you have to get your first customers and sort of balancing growth hacks against the marketing flywheel, yeah. right? So the way that I think about this is there's, there's all these options for channels to potentially go invest in, right? Um, and it can feel a little overwhelming, uh, especially in early stages or in times when you're panicking to like pick one to go put dollars and effort against to get short-term returns because you need uh, short-term ROI just to survive, you know, the next few months, right? Mm -hmm. To get enough revenue to raise your next round of funding or to like get to profitability so you can, uh, you know, you and your founder, co-founders can survive. Sure. And my uh, advice here is, is pretty much always to go look for the intersection of these three things. Awesome. The area where you have personal passion and interest. And, and the reason I recommend that one is if you, I have never seen uh, a marketer who's like, oh God, I hate social media. I hate Twitter and LinkedIn and Facebook. I hate using them, I hate consuming stuff, but I'm really good at getting value from them for my organization. 
Mm -hmm. it, it doesn't happen, right? If you don't <laughs> care about it, if you have no interest in it, if it is not up your alley, you, you tend not to do a good job. So maybe if you're someone who can, you know, make yourself passionate about something, fine, make the investment. But if not, uh, I would I would urge against it. Uh, I do this personally. I really don't like paid advertising. I just, I just don't like, it. I recognize it can be very effective. I, I recognize that it's a, it can be an awesome channel. I recognize that ad inventory is awesome right now and prices are low, but I am not passionate about it. Mm -hmm. So it's not a place that I'm putting dollars and effort of SparkToro's against. Mm -hmm. um, and in the future, maybe we'll hire someone who's good at that and, and they have that passion and they'll do it. Uh, the second one is area where you can provide unique value to your audience. Uh, the key word being unique value, value that no one else is providing or no one else is providing well. Mm -hmm. uh, and that's often a challenge for a lot of marketers. And then this, this third one, which is areas that actually reach your customers and their influencers, like we talked about earlier. Mm -hmm. If you are not reaching people who can amplify, then your message sort of stops because, you know, not to use a viral spread analogy, but R equals zero, right? R zero is happening. Uh, if if all you can do is broadcast to the same people over and over, just your customers and no one who can amplify it further. For sure. Um, my, you know, my, my recommendation for founders is this sort of invest in a few of these tactics before you launch so that you have a pre-existing community that wants to support you. But when you're thinking about that right now, right, even if it is the case that your business has been going, but, but business is going down, you, we all know there is a recovery coming, right? This is, this is, more so than any other recession, I think in the last hundred years, it's not a, oh, you know, something is fundamentally wrong. It's no, it's just, we all have to stay the heck home, yeah. right? And so we can't go out and spend. So consumer spending is down and that hits the rest of everything. And then at some point we will all be able to go out again and it, a rebound will happen. It is, it is absolutely the case. If we have that pre-existing community of people who want to support and amplify us, we're going to benefit when that happens. And so here's where growth hacks and marketing flywheel come in, right? So the idea is a, a marketing flywheel is this, this structured system you build that scales with decreasing friction. Mm -hmm. So I'll, this is how Moz did it, right? It's like our content marketing flywheel, which is I'd do some keyword research, I'd have some intuition, I'd publish content, push that to our subscribers, promote it on social, then we'd earn links and more amplification from it. So all our social channels and our RSS feed, right, our subscription and our email list and word of mouth would get bigger mm -hmm. and then we'd grow our authority and now we can rank for more and more competitive keywords and earn more search traffic, right? And this, the first few revolutions are really hard. Yeah. Like the first few times, getting one link was impossible, <laughs> right? But, uh, but this works in, in, in a bunch of ways and then it gets easier over time, right? So PR and ads, flywheel, right, sort of works in a similar fashion, uh, say events and sponsorship model, same thing, right? And there's plenty of companies who do this, especially in B2B software. The idea is it's hard at first, but then it gets easier and more and more profitable as you scale. It. And where, where I like growth hacks mm -hmm. is when you find, uh, oops, when you find one of these, let's say I'm doing the, uh, the PR and ads model. Mm -hmm. What I like is you find an area where you're hitting friction. Yeah. Like, oh, we are hitting friction because our pitches aren't resonating. Okay, let's find a hack, a growth hack, one, one thing that like the media is loving right now. Uh, let's shift all of our text content to we're going to do visual graphs. Mm -hmm. Graphs and charts, like we're that's our growth hack for right now is to do graphs and charts that the media is going to amplify. Okay, cool. I like it. I think that's going to work well right now. There's a lot of people paying attention to a lot more graphs. I don't know if you've seen the, the meme that's like, um, you know, uh, uh, amount of attention being paid to graphs right now. And you can see like, <laughs> the COVID crisis is exponential. Like it. Um, growth. And, and uh, I think finding, or, or maybe it's expanding your social following, right? Mm -hmm. Like we know we need to get social going as a channel. So let's find a hack. Okay, what we're going to do is we are going to use um, uh, whatever meme culture uh, to take all of the stuff that we're doing and turn it into uh, these amplifiable uh, memes. I 
I don't know if you've seen it, but I love, um, uh, let's see, Liz and Molly. I used one of their, um, oh, I need to share this screen with you. Stop that share, start this share. <laughs> that one. Um, so they they basically took this, um, I don't know if you can see there, right? They do stuff uh, like these, right? They make cartoons. Um, that, <laughs> yeah, there you go. <laughs> uh, it, it's very, it's like very relatable stuff and it is not directly related to what they actually do, right? Their consulting practice in their book, but it, it is absolutely earning them attention and awareness in business right now, right? And so, so they have basically said, oh, we have this flywheel uh, that we're trying to build around getting, gaining attention. And part of that is our book, No Hard Feelings. And to sell that book, we need to get more people into our top of funnel. And to do that, we're gonna use these cartoons. That's our like growth hack. That's, That's awesome. where I like hacks. Okay. You, you build the flywheel, you find the point of friction, you apply the hack. Yeah, yeah, awesome, sweet. Christ, right, okay, so I'm, I'm conscious that we've got, probably got somewhere between five and ten minutes round, left, and we've got several questions. So if you're up for it, Rand, we're going to do a quick fire round. And, uh, All right, yeah, quick fire. Um, so uh, the top question is, if looking for work uh, when you're in, uh, when in the current situation, how do you go about looking for work? Recruiters say there's nothing right now. And uh, granted, that's, you know, yeah. Uh, let's see, there are a few resources. There's um, a website called Still Hiring. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I might check that out. Uh, there's a few, oh gosh, um, that uh, the one that I just shared from, uh, what's their name? Um, whoops, that's the wrong presentation. Uh, from the folks who are doing this work here, uh, uh, Candor, so they've got um, a data set of a bunch of, of companies. They have an air table on that site. Let me go pull that and put it in the chat for everybody. Uh, chat to all panelists and attendees, that one. Nice. Um, yeah, uh, so, and gosh, I wonder if I can make, uh, you know what, I can make this presentation available too, because there might be other links in there, but I'll, I'll put that in the chat in a second um, with a Google Drive. Uh, the other thing that I would uh, think very strongly about right now from a hiring perspective is to offer to help people who need help, mm -hmm. right? So, so let's say there, it's not, it's not just uh, like people in your life, people in your network, uh, companies, individuals, help them do the thing that you are good at. Mm -hmm. And over the next few weeks and months as recovery happens and as hiring picks up again, uh, there will, you know, those people will remember that help that you provided and that you did a good job and, and reach out. Awesome. Sweet. Number two, uh, what would be your top three recommendations to push, push your personal brand during this crisis? Oh, gosh. I think it's a little bit of a dangerous time to be um, doing personal branding, especially personal branding that feels self-centered. Mm -hmm. um, and so my... Uh, I'm going to go back to what we've been talking about throughout this, which is I, I think that helping other people in uh, amplifiable ways is a really good way to go. Um, uh, if you have financial resources uh, to spare and you are looking to um, sort of gain traction, one of the things that um, I've seen a few folks do is to basically say, hey, uh, I am going to be whatever, producing work. Uh, I've seen cartoonists do this, for example, right? Where they're like, hey, for every $50 donation to this charity, I will send you a piece of my work that is hand signed, nice. right? And that's very much building their personal brand because tons of people amplify it. Sure. But also it's, it's for a great cause, right? Like you're, you're really helping people. Um, Absolutely. I love that. And nice. Just going back to helping people, as you said, same thing. Yeah, yeah, right. And so I, I would just align align the philosophy and empathy of the moment mm -hmm. with with your goal, um, as opposed to, you know, making it all about yourself. For sure. So we have a question from our mutual friend Mark Whitwood, who, um, in many ways, I have a 
<laughs> oh my god <laughs> and I have mark to thank for uh, this connection a long long time ago um so should marketing um be stopped in a in a promotion form and people actually take this opportunity to go back to their fun fundamentals for example positioning and i know that you're a fan of april dunford as an example uh, who's fabulous on, on this kind of yeah. thing yeah uh, uh let's see so first off um everyone should buy april's book absolutely awesome uh i uh sorry obviously awesome uh the, the let's see i don't think it's a great time to stop all marketing i do think it is a very good time to uh reconsider your fundamental value proposition and how you fit into um you know, the, the emerging trends, right, that we've identified at least with wave one and two of this uh, ongoing crisis. And then uh, to think about whether your marketing fits appropriately with those. Mm -hmm. and, and that's um, going to be not true for a lot of people. And so that realignment makes a lot of sense. Uh, whether I would, I would not, I would probably not pause all marketing right now um, especially if you see channels that are still working, right? Because that means you are still helping people and attracting them and, and converting them. And it could be dangerous to cut that off entirely. Mm -hmm. um, you know, one of the things that we all have to do is survive this crisis, right? Mm -hmm. as, as individuals, as people, um, as participants in our, our e this ecosystem we've created. Um, but I think, I think it's a great time to re-examine priorities, yeah. Awesome. And, and Mark's also said a second question, but I'm going to rephrase this as a, as a statement more than anything. Um, so he said, can you position your product or service as a way to save money rather than something that offers the promise of more revenue? I think we've seen that from the example that you gave earlier, that that's yeah. a great way of sort of yeah, and I think narrative. And, and sort in, of some, uh, in some sectors, that's going to be really powerful, right? Mm -hmm. So for a lot of agencies and consultants, I think saying right now, we can help you cut the right marketing. You know, if you need to cut your marketing budget in half, but only lose 10% of your uh, results, come to us, right? I think that's a great pitch for an agency uh, right now. And that's a great way to show, um, you know, show potential results. I, I would not say it's true in every industry. For a lot, if you are helping people in growth sectors, mm -hmm. I would instead be biasing to messages that 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 still pitch, hey, we can find affordable growth or creative avenues for growth. So I think it's about speaking to your customer. For sure, absolutely. And I guess that's the fundamental of marketing, as uh, as Mark was speaking about. Anyway, you know, understand yeah, what absolutely. the customer wants. Um, so this is a question from my good friend Kelly. Uh, I keep hearing people. Uh, I keep hearing from people that now is not the time to sell. I really don't agree with this, but would love to hear your thoughts, Rand. Even if you're in marketing to an industry that's struggling, listening to them, helping them through, your marketing is all about long-term brand building, which leads to selling. So yeah. as much of a statement as a question, but. Yeah, I think, um, I think there's some truth in the concept that it's a bad time to exclusively sell. Mm -hmm. And it's a bad time to feel salesy. Mm -hmm. Right. So if your uh, sales team's email outreach, cold outreach or warm outreach looks exactly the same as it did 90 days ago, that's weird. It doesn't feel right. Um, and and you, you and I can feel that pain, right? When we go into our email inboxes and we have messages that don't match the time. I don't know if anybody else has this, but you, you know, you sit down on your couch at night and you're watching Netflix. I, I was having this the, the other day with a movie that we were watching sort of remotely with friends, right? We hit play at the same time, called each other. Absolutely. <laughs> and I was like, oh my God, what are you doing in that bar? <laughs> Get out of that bar. There's too many people that, right? I'm watching television. Like this is not. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> <It's> like, <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> everything just feels a little different, right? Everything feels strange. And so I think that it is a great time to do a gut check uh, with how your messaging is. And if you are selling directly, that's not a bad thing. It just has to be considerate and cognizant of the environment that you're in. For sure. Uh, I think that's a really great point to take away, you know, that 
I, I think we are um, all going to be very hypersensitive at the moment, but um, yeah. that that doesn't mean that the entire world needs to stop. You know, and 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 the process of selling is, as you said in one of your opening remarks, it was literally marketing is you know a noble act if it's done in the right way to the right person at the right time you're improving their life you know so selling Just is read part the of room that. right read the room for sure absolutely so we'll go last one because uh we could be here all night uh, there's still a lot of questions and I, i'm terribly sorry if, if people have missed out um sorry no, my uh my wife is coming in here to, to get <laughs> You can see it. You can also have her. You know who's here is uh, uh, hey, Mark Jordan. Littlewood's on the. Hi. Is yeah. How's it going? Oh, they, you know, husband, don't show tax forms to people. My husband asked me to print that three days ago, five days ago, a week ago, but time has lost all meaning. So <laughs> it's just, just. I hope that I hope that you are actually in another geographic location. Uh, they're in the UK. Oh, yeah, thank God! Of. So this is a justified video. Chat. yeah yeah there's like That's hundreds of people on this call right are now. there really yeah. so i'm just completely interrupted <laughs> everyone your tax That's the problem. yeah <laughs> let's hope no one took a screenshot sorry about that joe sorry. no no no, no problem sorry. Sorry. thanks joe dude. by the way uh if anyone's uh enjoyed this conversation which i hope you have you also need to check out geraldine uh who's at, oh, yeah. at everywhereist on twitter She's awesome. Um, so shout out to Geraldine. <laughs> oh, thank you. Yeah, so she's wonderful. She is. She really is. Uh, on the one time I've met her, so uh, I can I can speak about that. Um, so last one, and I think it will hopefully be quite a, a fun, simple one, um, which is how can you create content when you're stuck at home? Uh, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. That's uh, that's really fair. So the. Um, Things that have worked really well for me, I get my creativity one of two ways, right? One is uh, watching other people's art. So that's, you know, television and movies and, and um, uh, you know, music and uh, reading, uh, all that kind of stuff like that. That really helps me. And then the other one is sort of the information consumption, mm -hmm. right? So you know, uh, seeing the stuff from similar web and the stuff from, um, uh, what should we call it from, um, Patreon and the stuff from Gumroad and, you know, all, uh, the stuff from, um, Wonderstock, right. And seeing the, the, the content creation out in the world. And I say, I think those two things sort of artistic consumption and information consumption, um, help me have my best ideas yeah. and, when you're stuck at home, you know, what, if you're a digital creator, it's an awesome time to create. Absolutely, right? Absolutely awesome time to create. There's nothing stopping you. The, the, um, I think the deep workflow that many of us talk about that's so hard to get at the office is, that, depending on your home situation, I recognize some people have a challenge there, um, but can be better and easier. Uh, so. That's awesome. Brilliant. Well, we need to let you escape um but i just want to say thank you so much for taking the time oh um, yeah. everyone should absolutely check out uh spark toro granted the the release has been delayed uh for yeah, now. but you can you can sign up you'll get an email as soon as we do the early access invites um absolutely. and and yeah hopefully uh hopefully things will will start lifting i'm feeling like the conversation is is gradually lifting over these um especially this week Sure. feels a little better than last week I, I see you know i see italy's graph sort of leveling out i see a few other places where, where the situation's improving so absolutely uh, i think there's hope on the horizon and that is um that's bringing me a lot of comfort i hope it's bringing other people comfort and uh i really appreciate all of you joining and joe thank you so much for putting this together it was great no, no, honestly it's so much fun so thank you very very much really appreciate it good man right thank you everyone and uh stay safe and stay inside and wash your hands and uh have a lovely night <laughs> take care take care